Across the channel, we talk about some highly unusual disappearances, but these disappearances generally only involve a single person. It's perhaps easier to understand that a single person can walk off and never return, but when it involves an entire plane with its crew and passengers disappearing in tow, many questions are left unanswered. This is a pain that thousands of families feel every year when they are thrust into this limbo of not knowing what's happened to their loved ones. These are the kinds of inexplicable events that puzzle authorities, investigators and families alike. If these events aren't strange enough, they're made even eerier when in some cases, experts are not able to reach a satisfactory conclusion by way of lack of evidence. Before we get into this video, I'd like to thank Kizim Dinzotta for providing a lot of the research for this video. If you're ever in need of an article writer, then you can find a link to her in the description below. Now with that being said, let's get into the first disappearance. At 12.42am on the 8th of March 2014, 239 people boarded the Malaysia Airlines Boeing 777 to Beijing from Kuala Lumpur Airport located in Malaysia, but these people never arrived at their destination. Researchers found that the plane made an unexpected diversion from its route and travelled back in the opposite direction towards Malaysia. The plane turned south of Penang and then towards the southern Indian Ocean. This was the last time that the flight was seen or heard from again. The plane, nor its passengers, have ever been found. MH370 last communicated with air traffic at 1.29am before it disappeared over the South China Sea. 53-year-old Zahari Ahmed Shah, one of the most senior captains at Malaysian Airlines, was in control of the plane at the time of disappearance. Co-piloting was 27-year-old Fariq Hamid, who was training at the time. This flight was meant to be Farrakh's final training session before he's completely certified as a pilot in his own right. Experts have come up with various explanations as to what actually happened to MH370, but the sheer lack of evidence has largely left them puzzled. Some experts believe that it was a deliberate act by Zahari. They suggest that the plane may have changed course because he wanted to make a final goodbye to his hometown Penang before he went down with the craft. According to these experts, Zahari could have depressurized the plane, knocking everyone out who wasn't wearing an oxygen mask. This could explain as to why there was complete silence from the plane, there was no mayday reported, or even an attempt at an emergency call. While only speculation, some have pointed to the fact that it appeared that Zahari's marriage was coming to an end. Thus, perhaps it was too much for him. In contrast, however, Christine Negroni, a leading aircraft investigator, believes that instead of being a deliberate act, the pilot may have suffered from a condition known as hypoxia. This is where the body is deprived of adequate oxygen supply at the tissue level, causing disorientation before passing out. She believes that out of stress, Zahari may have forgotten to turn on the depressurization switch. She describes that he may simply have gone for a bathroom break and while away, the plane suffered from a sudden depressurization. He may have tried to make his way back to the cockpit and lost consciousness. Christine believes that the plane may have suffered from an electrical malfunction that knocked out the systems causing the depressurization. Other experts have suggested that the plane may have been taken over by a group and landed at a remote location. Author Jeff Wise made the claim that one of the passengers was messing with the onboard electronics to make it appear that the plane simply went down into the ocean. But Jeff claims that the plane did not go into the ocean, and instead made its way over Kazakhstan before landing in a Russian-owned airport. Others have argued in favour of this supposed hijacking, stating that a mysterious load of 89 kilograms was secretly loaded into the flight. According to an engineer whose wife and two children were on board, it was added to the flight list after takeoff. At this point, it's important to note that no evidence has ever been found in relation to the aircraft, such as any kind of wreckage, which many have dubbed as unusual and has sparked some unconventional explanations, so let's get bizarre. According to theweek.co.uk, over the years, a growing number of people believe that something highly unusual happened to MH370. 
Some bloggers have pointed to a number of recent UFO sightings in Malaysia, arguing that whatever these things were, they may have had something to do with the disappearance. However, I want to make it clear that along with all the other theories, there is no clear evidence of this. Ultimately, despite a massive search effort and millions of dollars being poured into finding out what happened to MH370, it has never been found and what exactly happened remains a mystery. What do you think? Amelia Earhart, 39 years old at the time of her disappearance, went missing on the 2nd of July, 1937. Amelia had broken several aviation records in the past and was globally celebrated as the first woman to fly over the Atlantic Ocean in 1928. Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan, were on a trip to circumnavigate the globe. Things were going well for the pair until the 2nd of July, 1937. By this time, they had made 20 successful stops and now found themselves in Leh, New Guinea. This was the last leg of the flight and they were aiming for the tiny island known as Howland Island. This is just north of the equator in the central Pacific Ocean, but they never arrived. The United States Coast Guard, alongside the Navy, scoured the area by ship and plane for weeks. Amelia's husband, George Putnam, also enlisted civilian mariners to continue the search. Despite over 80 years passing now, the circumstances of her disappearance remain a mystery. Perhaps the pair simply ran out of fuel, but as experts admit, we have no real way of proving this. According to The Sun, experts who set out to search for her in the Pacific Ocean said that it is a possibility that hungry crustaceans have long since eaten the evidence. A team of scientists led by National Geographic set out to find evidence as to what actually happened to Amelia and Fred. They assumed that the pair failed to locate their destination and instead landed on Nicomoro Island. They claim that their landing may have been aided by a reef serving as a rough runway. This claim was reached as 13 human bones were found on the island in 1940 by the island's administrator, Gerald Gallagher. The 13 bones were sent to Fiji to be analysed, where they were examined by D.W. Hoodless. Perhaps strangely, afterwards he discarded the bones preventing any further assessment or DNA measurement. It's unclear why he did this. In an article written by Aerotime.Aero, this is what they have to say. Three years later, after the plane seemingly vanished into thin air, British official Gerald Gallagher found a partial human skeleton, 12 of the bones including a humerus, radius and tibia. He also found remains of a campsite and a woman's shoe on Niku Mororo Island. The bones were examined in Fiji by D.W. Hoodless, who concluded that the bones belonged to a short man of European descent. Despite discarding the bones, Hoodless's measurements survived and were recently examined by a forensic anthropologist, Richard Jantz. The professor analysed the measurements taken by Hoodless and compared them with Earhart's body dimensions, indicated by numerous photographs and articles of clothing. He assessed that Hoodless's conclusion was incorrect and the bones found on the island are most likely to be Earhart's. He said, the bones are consistent with her heart in all respects we know or can reasonably infer. Her height is entirely consistent with the bones. The skull measurements are at least suggestive of female, but convincingly is the similarity of the bone lengths to the reconstructed lengths of her heart's bones. But anyway, the theory indicated that after landing, Fred may have become a castaway while Amelia's remains were eaten by coconut crabs, also known as the largest crabs on Earth. Though, despite the study of the bones, it's important to note that this is still in the realm of speculation, given that we can never be sure since the bones disappeared. Another acknowledged oddity in regards to this theory is the fact that no evidence of the plane was ever found which would have been expected, given that the bones were found. The last time Amelia was ever heard from was 8.43am on the day of her disappearance, confirming that she was flying on a northwest to southeast navigational line that bisected the island without indicating the direction she planned to take thereafter. 
At this point, it's important to note that this is just a theory and all searches to date have failed to provide a single piece of evidence as to what actually happened on that day. The plane, nor Amelia or Fred, have ever been found, or at least officially. Many people believe that Amelia and Fred were taken and captured by the Japanese and cite this picture stating that the ship behind them was the Koshimaru, a Japanese naval vessel that captured them. According to Wikipedia, the image in question was found in the National Archives at the College Park of Juetatol in the South Pacific Mandate, the Japanese Mandate for the Marshall Islands. The photograph includes two European looking people. The documentary, known as Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence, through a forensic analyst who specialised in facial recognition, posited that it was very likely to be a picture of a captured Earhart and Noonan. However, two days after the publication of the documentary, a Japanese historian and blogger, Kota Yamano, investigated the issue and found that the original source of the photograph was from 1935, thus proving that this picture was not of the pair, given that they went missing in 1937. Many people have stated that it is unusual that no evidence has ever been recovered. While that was the only real lead at the time, its dismissal essentially means that we have absolutely no evidence of what happened to Amelia or Fred. As Aerotime.Aero put it, they seem to have vanished into thin air. What do you think happened here? Anyway, moving on, let's examine another. Similar to Amelia Earhart, Glenn Miller was well known and highly celebrated. Glenn led the Army Air Force Band, which gave live concerts and made broadcasts to troops during the Second World War. On the afternoon of December the 15th, 1944, he boarded the UC-64A Norseman from England to a concert to entertain the troops in Paris, but disappeared over the English Channel and was never found. His disappearance was not announced until the 24th of December. Royal Air Force spotters claimed to have seen the plane heading over the channel and that was the last time that it was seen. One prominent theory as to what took place speculated that Glenn may have been a victim to a friendly fire incident. The theory details that during the same day as his disappearance, 138 British planes heading to Germany for a raid was forced to turn back due to bad weather conditions. The planes were said to be carrying more than 100,000 live explosives and received an order to drop them in the English Channel because of the risk of explosion upon landing. The pilots did as commanded and according to British airman Fred Shaw, who was part of this wave, out of his window he reported seeing a plane. He said that the blast wave struck the plane and sent it plummeting into the water. Though he thought nothing of it at the time, he heard of Glenn's disappearance years later and checked his logbook. He maintains that the two events occurred on the same day. Another theory states that Glenn may have been acting in a spy capacity and was captured by the Germans while trying to recover secretive information about the German war machine. In contrast though, a similar theory states that Glenn was sent to meet the Germans to discuss a possible peace agreement, but again, it didn't end well. His brother Herb, on the other hand, also a musician, believes that his brother passed away as a result of lung cancer in England. He said that Glenn, who was a chain smoker, wrote a letter to him six months before his disappearance, making Herb aware of his failing health. He said that he was losing a significant amount of weight and had trouble breathing. Herb believes that his brother may have helped devise the plane story to allow him to be remembered as a hero, rather than passing away as a result of illness. Though it's important to note that none of these theories have held up to scrutiny over the years, and all we know is that Glenn's plane disappeared while on a routine flight from Britain to Paris, and no evidence has ever been recovered as to what happened. Now moving on, let's have a look at another. Perhaps something that makes these disappearances so mysterious is the fact that the whereabouts or events leading up to and during the disappearance remain unknown even after millions of dollars are put into finding them with the best technology and expertise only to find nothing. 
Shortly after sunset on the 25th of May 2003, engineer Ben Charles Padilla, alongside one of his employees by the name of Mikel Mutantu, boarded the Boeing 727 with the tail number N844AA at Quattro de Fevereiro International Airport in Angol. Soon after the men boarded the plane, it began an unauthorized taxiing. According to press reports, the plane maneuvered erratically and entered into the runway without clearance. The control towers attempted to make contact with the plane, but received no response. The Boeing 727 took flight to the southwest and headed over the Atlantic Ocean with its lights off and transponder not answering. The tower repeatedly tried to establish communication, but never received a response. Air traffic lost sight of the aircraft not long after this, and that was the last time it was ever seen or heard from again. The Boeing was manufactured in 1975 and was owned by a Miami-based company, Aerospace Sales and Leasing. The company leased the plane to TAAG Angola Airlines, where it sat idle at the Luando Airport for 14 months, accruing more than $4 million in airport charges. It was in the process of being converted for use by IRS Airlines. Ben was a certified flight engineer and did hold a private pilot license, but he, nor Mikel, knew how to fly a Boeing 727. But they were the only two people known to have been on board. The FBI, CIA and the US Department of Homeland Security studied this incident, but all seemed to reach a different conclusion. The CIA feared that the aircraft might have been taken by a group who wished to use it for destructive purposes against Western targets in Africa. However, it's believed that this was later dismissed as satellite photography alongside African authorities could find no evidence of the aircraft on the continent. The FBI on the other hand concluded that it had likely crashed, though no evidence of this was ever found. They later suggested that the Boeing may have been flown to an unknown hangar where its parts were stripped. Ultimately though, it's unclear what happened to the Boeing and it's another instance of a plane mysteriously vanishing. Now, while this next disappearance has been solved, it's still an interesting case worth talking about as there seems to still be a lot of misinformation out there about it. The BSAA Avro Lancastrian, dubbed Stardust, was a Canadian and British passenger and mail transport aircraft. Eleven people were on the flight on the day of the disappearance. The captain was Reginald Cook, a distinguished Royal Air Force pilot who held extensive combat experience during the Second World War. Cook's first and second officers aboard the flight were also war veterans with combat experience. The Stardust, alongside its 11 passengers, took flight on the 2nd of August 1947 at 1.46pm from Buenos Aires Airport and mysteriously vanished at some point during the flight. The final transmission from the Stardust relayed to Santiago's airport was a Morse code transcription, Stendek. The operator asked for clarification two more times and Stendek was relayed to them. At the time, this was highly unusual and the meaning has been debated since. One interpretation is that Stendek was an acronym for Staring En Route Descent, or Severe Turbulence Encountered, Now Descending Emergency Crash Landing. Another suggestion was that Stendek is an anagram of descent, though to this day, it's still not clear what Reginald meant. At the time, search teams scoured the mountains around the disappearance location, but found absolutely nothing to suggest that the plane had been there. This led to speculations that something highly unusual may have occurred on that mountain. And for over 50 years, that was all of the information we had, so speculations ran wild. In 1998, two Argentinian climbers ascended Mount Tupangato, approximately 50 miles east of Santiago, and came across the wreckage of the aircraft's engine. They also found clothing and other parts of the plane scattered about. Two years later, another expedition was conducted by the Argentinian military and found DNA evidence and confirmed that it was in fact the Stardust with its passengers. Experts confirmed that it was as a result of a crash rather than a mid-air explosion. Here is some information from Wikipedia. 
In the late 1990s, pieces of the wreckage from the mission aircraft began to emerge from the glacial ice. It is now believed that the crew became confused as to their exact location while flying at high altitudes through the jet stream. Mistakenly believing that they had already cleared the mountain tops, they started their descent where they were in fact still behind cloud covered peaks. And the Stardust crashed into Mount Tupungato, burying itself in the snow and ice. While not a mystery anymore, I thought it was still worth looking at. But anyway, let's have a look at the final disappearance. On December the 5th, 1945, Commander Charles Taylor took the lead in a training flight with five TBM Avengers. At 2.10pm on the day of disappearance, the five Avengers took flight, one after the other, from the Naval Air Station of Fort Lauderdale at Florida for a routine training session. The plan was simple, to fly east into the ocean for 56 miles up to Hens and Chicken Shoal to practice their accuracy. Afterwards, they were to go further east for another 67 miles towards the Bahamas. At which point they were supposed to go north for 73 miles before heading back to the naval base in Florida. The intention was to cover a triangular area just over the sea, and at this time the weather was reported as excellent. One hour after taking to the skies, things began to get strange and only went from bad to worse. At approximately 3.30pm, Commander Taylor relayed to the control tower that his compass had malfunctioned. Charles believed that they were located somewhere around the Florida Keys, which is much further to the south than the eastbound direction they were supposed to travel. This isn't the first time that strange equipment malfunctions have been reported in that area, but that's a topic for another time. Anyway, the group were instructed to turn north and fly towards Miami, given that Charles was adamant about his location being near the Florida Keys. At 3.45pm, Charles sent another message, only this time sounding worried, he said, Cannot see, and we seem to be off course. We cannot be sure where we are. Repeat, cannot see land. One hour later, at 4.45pm, the group was still horribly lost and flying in the wrong direction. The men at the base station instructed Charles to hand over the controls to one of the others. But this is an instruction it looks like Charles ignored. A transmission was picked up by one of the others, saying, If we could just fly west, we would get home. This information may have taken them home, but we will never know for sure. The Com Gulf Center traced Flight 19 to the east of New Simrana, but it was too late as communication became very poor. The light was fading fast and the weather took a turn for the worst and to make matters even worse, the planes were now running low on fuel. The group were last heard from at 7.04pm just before they disappeared. 20 minutes later, two Martin Marina planes were sent to search for Flight 19. The Mariners had flying boats that could land on the sea for rescue, but there was no sign of them at all. To make matters even more bizarre, one of the Mariners would never return and he too had gone missing. More than 300 Navy boats and aircraft attempted to find them, but nothing was ever found. It's important to note that the flying boats in question were notoriously accident prone and it was feared that it may have exploded. A merchant ship did report seeing a fireball, but it was never confirmed, and again the mariner nor the pilots were ever found. Navy Lieutenant David White would later recall, They just vanished. We had hundreds of planes out looking and we searched over land and water for days and nobody ever found the bodies or any debris. A Navy Board of Investigation was also left scratching their head. It argued that Charles may have confused the Bahamas for the Florida Keys after his compasses malfunctioned, but it could find no clear explanation as to why Flight 19 had become so disoriented. The members eventually attributed the loss to causes or reasons unknown. No definitive signs of the aircraft or anyone involved have ever been found. Please do leave a like and subscribe if you liked the video or a dislike if you didn't. Feel free to share your honest opinion. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of you that have subscribed to the channel and who share these videos. I appreciate it a lot and I can't thank you enough. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to my patrons who make these videos possible, so thank you very much to all who have signed up. And if you'd like to have a look at my Patreon, you can find the link to that in the description below. 
Anyway, do let me know what you thought of this one, and you'll find all of the sources and links in the description below. As always, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. It helps me a lot. I hope that you have a great day or evening, depending on where you are. Be safe, guys, and I'll catch you soon.